I'm regularly asked by my patients, why should I choose you, Dr. Haber, over another surgeon? And as we discuss my qualifications, I make it clear there is no simple answer to that question. It's a complex combination of education, training, experience, certification, and more. But it's a very important question. And to help me answer that question, I've invited a surgeon who ticks every box on the qualification checklist, Dr. Russell Knudsen from Sydney, Australia. Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Haber, hair loss expert and hair transplant surgeon from Cleveland, Ohio. Join me and the Hair Transplant Roadshow as I travel the globe seeking answers to important surgical and non-surgical hair loss questions from the true experts in the field. So today, the Hair Transplant Roadshow travels down under to Sydney, Australia, where my guest is the world-famous Dr. Russell Knudsen. Please support this program by selecting like, subscribe, and requesting notifications when our next episode is available, and feel free to post comments and topic suggestions as well. There are few people in the world of hair that are as respected and liked as much as Russell, and he's played an important role in advancing our field over the past few decades. Russell is the director of the Nutsen Clinic, devoted exclusively to hair restoration surgery, He's one of the founding members of the ISHRS and has served the society and the field of hair restoration in every imaginable capacity, including on the Board of Governors and as president. He's a fellow member of the International Society of Hair Restoration Surgery. He's certified by the American Board of Hair Restoration Surgery. He served for three years as editor of the Hair Transplant Forum International. He's authored textbook chapters, articles, has lectured on almost every continent, it's no surprise then that he was also honored with the Golden Follicle Award for his clinical contributions to our field, as well as the coveted Manfred Lucas Award, the very highest honor a hair transplant surgeon can receive in recognition of his life's work. Russell is also one of the originators of The Hair Loss Show, a very popular YouTube channel based in Australia. I could not be more delighted to have my distinguished colleague help me discuss how to choose a hair transplant surgeon. Hi, Russell. Hi, Bob. Thank you very much for that lovely welcome. Russell, why don't we start by having you describe your practice in Sydney? So basically, I've been practicing in Sydney since 1984, since I was a child. And at no time have I ever delegated the consulting process or the follow-up process for my patients to a consultant or another person. I believe in establishing a personal relationship with the patient right from the get-go. And my full-time practice involves me doing initial consultations with the patient. Obviously, uh, I'm involved in the surgery with them and I do all the follow-ups myself because I believe it's critical in this journey, and it really is a journey, between the patient and the, the doctor, uh, and it goes for decades in some cases, that you establish a trusting relationship and develop great communication lines between the patient and the surgeon, which minimizes the, the risk of dissatisfaction uh, through miscommunication uh, between the two. So that's the way I've always personalized my practice to practice in that manner so that I absolutely know everything that's going on and I know what I've said to the patient and I know what the patient said to me and to me that just minimizes the risk and maximizes the benefit of the relationship. It's always amazing to me that there are doctors who almost completely remove themselves from that process and uh, that's disturbing. I remember in a meeting, Bob, uh, you know, during questions after a lecture, one of the, the doctors said his time was most usefully spent in the theatre. So, you know, he delegated everything outside the theatre to, to elsewhere and he just met the patient in the theatre. And I think that is a recipe for potential disaster because for, when the patient gets to the theatre, they're both nervous and uh, sometimes won't say everything they want to say in front of the doctor and they also um, uh, don't have an equal power relationship once they get to the theatre they you know they tend to go along with whatever is being suggested and so uh, the reality is it's not really a two-way communication in, in a, as equals what if that's the first time you're going to meet them 
And, um, you know, I, I made the comment in response that I felt that, you know, the, as doctors, we were treating the whole patient. We weren't just treating the surgical aspect where we're being the technician for the whatever small amount of time we meet them in the theater. Delegating everything is a great way to maximize profit, but it's not good medical care. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, by the mm -hmm. time a person is in your operating room, they've taken time off from work, they have made a commitment. That, that's a bad time for them to all of a sudden say they don't want to do that. I think it's a, an important point. And I was going to say, I think there are two kinds of patients, those who take the time to figure out what makes a great surgeon, they do appropriate investigations, and those who are easily fooled by claims of greatness. So what are the steps that a patient should take to make sure they find a great surgeon? So it's interesting, you're right. I mean, I suppose in my practice, um, the, the number of people that have properly researched it is in the minority. And uh, the number of people that um, are just vaguely aware that uh, there are things available is probably still the majority of people. So the situation is that, you know, sometimes when they're shopping, and I, I describe it as shopping, they come in and say, well, why should I choose you? And they are just going through the, um, you know, the Google search or the what used to be the yellow pages and just, you know, ticking boxes and, and interviewing. Um, so effectively, if you're going to be talking, first of all, I think it's important to talk to the surgeon, right? If you're going to contact a clinic, um, you need to talk to the surgeon. You don't need to talk to the salesperson or the consultant because their job is to get you in the theatre because that's how they make a living. So you need to do this. And, and the, the journey of hair loss that can begin in the teens uh, for these young men uh, all the way through life. Now, this is a whole of life experience where they are dealing with a progressive condition. So you want whole of holistic care. And this is what the doctor can offer you to, to tell you at what stage you are what is likely to happen in the next short period of time because it's very difficult to be able to predict the long-term outcomes. But if you, if you talk to the doctor about it, it should not just involve about what surgery can do now, it should be about how you manage this problem going forward. So the first thing is you want to talk to the doctor. That's very, very important. Number two, when you talk to the doctor, you want to hear him say it's more than just surgery. Because if, if you're having a consultation with a doctor and all they're talking about is surgery, um, then you're in trouble. Uh, because there's no acknowledgement then of the commitment that you have made if you, if you proceed with surgery. I say to my patients, if you take medication and stop, the worst thing that can happen is that you were bald naturally as nature intended. But once I operate on you, if progression of baldness occurs, you are now going to bald unnaturally and that will have consequences that will force you to actually respond, usually by having more surgery. So again, you want to hear the doctor talk about the risk benefits of operating without medication versus operating with medication, what the benefits are and the risks are of medication. It's absolutely critical. And I know in my practice, we sometimes manage for years medically before we get ready for surgery and that's it's very common that's very appropriate and it, not only is it appropriate it, it, it it's it should, it should almost be compulsory yeah um that that you establish that because if people don't want i mean there are a small percentage of patients who come into your practice and say i don't want to do medication and you've told me that i'll need top-up surgeries going forward in the future that's my preference that's a small percentage of patients in my experience if you explain the, the benefits and the ability to reduce the risk of future surgery and therefore cost of future surgery and the small but significant risk that some patients are going to run out of donor hair sometime in the future, then they'll usually buy into the argument. So that's very, very important to do that educating. The third thing you want, uh, apart from the, the, the doctor talking to you about the benefits of medicine and the, versus the benefits of surgery and the benefits of combining them, the third thing you want to do is experience. Now, 
it's not that people who have been operating for 10 years are necessarily better than people who are operating for two years. But what the people who have significant experience have the experience of is watching what happens with progression of the balding after they operate. And that's the benefit there, that they actually understand and have seen it. It's not a, just a, some kind of theoretical construct that they get taught about out of a textbook. They actually see it and they actually live the experience. So if you have experience in your surgeon, they are more likely to be very aware of what the long-term progression risks are and how that inter uh, interacts with the surgical plan and the management plan going forward. Um, and again, because a lot of doctors work for entities that are very aggressive in marketing in all places in the world, um, you want to be careful that you're not just a clinic that claims to have invented the wheel. Uh, they have their own technique that uh, is the most refined technique in the world, that, um, they, that they do painless surgery, they do scarless surgery. When you, when you, if it seems, there's an old maxim which is if it seems too good to be true, it is. And patients are often unable to discern this because it's surprising how many patients sit in front of me and don't think there's any cutting involved in hair transplant. They think that you just pluck the hairs out and you plant them and, and that there's, it's not surgical. So when people make claims of painless and scarless, it makes sense to them because they don't think it's surgery. Yeah, there are a lot of buzzwords that, make, that should make the patient pause. Uh, it, like I said, if it sounds too good or if they're making claims that seem ridiculous, you know, doctor that invented the procedure or they're the best in the world, these are warning signs. You can almost be certain they're not the best in the world if they claim to be the best in the world. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I'm talking to you as one of the, the great surgeons of the world and I know exactly um, that, that you're not the type of guy that puts that on his website or his advertising because you don't need to. To, to do that. If you, you don't need to prove that to anybody when you have the credentials uh, that, that we have, that we have the experience that we have, we don't need to be talking ourselves up. So the, the next thing that's, that's generally going to be quite important is to get a second opinion. Um, you know, again, I am constantly surprised by people who just go along with a piece of pretty awful advice um, you know, in the moment because they got caught up in the emotion of whatever the cell, the cell technique was and they went, went ahead with that really um, understanding that they probably should take time to think about it. I mean, for cosmetic surgery procedures, certainly in Australia, we're required to have a seven day cooling off period. So if I do the consultation on say the first of the month, really I shouldn't be allowed to touch them until the 8th of the month to have that seven day cooling off period for them to think about it. So again, if, if, the, if the patient feels that he's being pressured or rushed into a decision to sign on the dotted line, that's a, that's a red flag to me. Um, I, I never ever um, suggest when the next available operating appointment is to the patient unless they specifically ask of it. The way I would ask the patient if they, you know, if they've said, well, you know, look, I am, and uh, I'm interested in having a procedure, I would say something on the line. So, well, what's your time frame for this? And what are you thinking about for this? Is it months? Is it when is it? When is it? It's such an open question. There's no pressure. And again, personally, in my practice, we don't do follow-up letters. We don't do follow-up phone calls. I want the patient to be able to go away, take their time, think about it. Uh, and then comes the, the decision, right? Our job is to educate them, to try and make, let them make a good decision for themselves, whatever that decision is. I think, you know, what's the, the thread that ties most of what you've said so far happens with the, the patient's interaction with the surgeon. It's such, a, such an important thing. There are things that the patient needs to do before they get to that point, but at some point, you should sit in front of your surgeon and be able to ask questions to get that comfort level that this person is ethical, uh, skilled, and you have those, uh, uh, that, that comfort level. But before you get there, before the patient's going to come to your office, they're probably going to go 
and investigate you. you know, how important are memberships and certification? When I talked to uh, Dr. Farjo from Manchester a few weeks ago, we, we talked about the importance of the ISHRS membership. What, what do you feel about that? So, I agree. The, what you, basically for people to maintain medical registrations around the world, there has to be a certain amount of continuing professional development, really as part of their licensing. And what that means is that we should be constantly updating our knowledge uh, and because things change, of course, and evolve. And there are numerous ways to do it. You can read the scientific journals and articles, but nobody can check on that. But if you have a membership of a credible society like the ISHRS that is committed to education, to all physicians that wish to, to um, learn how to uh, treat and surgically perform hair transplants, then it's a good starting point. And then if you look at whether they actually go to the meetings as distinct from just signing um, you know, the form that they're a member, if they actually attend the meetings, they're much more likely to be committed to the concept of bettering the care that they're offering, staying up to date with the latest developments in the field. So the ISHRS is a good example of that. You I mentioned think being a member of the ISHRS in no way guarantees competence. But I think yes. if you're not a member of the ISHRS, that is very concerning because only it's not difficult to become a member. But if you're not a member, it either means you're, you don't value education or you're not allowed to be a member. And that's that's a concerning. So my personal opinion is the first cutoff is that membership. Uh, and then you can move from there because it's very worrisome to me if you're not a member. Why wouldn't you take advantage of the extraordinary educational offerings of that society. Now there's of course associate member and full member and as I mentioned at the beginning you're a fellow member. You can only reach those levels if you have passed a whole series of, of hurdles that again demonstrate your commitment to education and it's all about education. It, it, and it is, it's a big bar um, to get to the fellow um, uh, level. The associate membership of course is the starting point uh, for physicians. But you're right, I mean, it's a demonstration of commitment. Now, the ISHRS isn't the only organisation in the world that offers education, but the reality is it's got the credibility because right now, um, 30, 30 years in, we're about to do our, um, our 30th meeting, uh, that's been the revolutionary educational organisation in the field, uh, uh, historically, um, the, the 30 years that that organization has been in existence has exploded uh, the knowledge uh, and around the world that, that was just done on an ad hoc basis before so yes it's you would say it's almost you know mandatory that people intelligent doctors who wanted to commit to the field uh, it would be a no-brainer that they should join the ishrs because that's the premier educational organization in the world i think the is HRS has trained more doctors in hair than all the rest of the society has put together because it's been going on for 30 years and our meetings are large and they're quite extraordinary. Uh, so I think it's very important. What about certification by the American Board of Hair Restoration Surgery? Again, this is, uh, you know, this becomes controversial because uh, people can misuse credentials. Um, it's not yeah, you know, the, the credential that's offered by the American Board is basically um, uh, an exam credential, uh, which basically is a written exam and for the initial uh, certification, an oral, um, what we call an oral viva. So that's a case study or multiple case studies that are discussed with surgeons to, to work out complicated cases and how you might manage them. So to get that, certification does um, require a certain degree of knowledge and good decision making to get to get it. So it's certainly useful and credible to have it. What it doesn't test uh, is the surgical skill set. You are, you are um, asked to provide evidence of case reports and photographs of before and afters. So 
in, an, uh, in a secondary manner, uh, secondary evidence manner, it certainly will assess uh, what the outcomes look like over a large series of cases. So that's reassuring. But it isn't, it isn't the kind of fellowship that people go through uh, in training programs that require um, on-site supervision over a number of years um, by respected peers to assess all aspects of their care. So it doesn't, and so it is wrong to actually use the credential incorrectly as if it's an equivalent to a, um, a board certification in the US or a fellowship of a college in other countries in the world, because it isn't, but it is still a very useful credential. And I felt right from the word go that even though that wasn't necessary to my practice, it was a level of commitment to the idea that I could show uh, the patients. And also, by doing it, I'm also showing other junior physicians that there's value to it by taking it because they know it's not necessary to my mature practice, but they do understand, I guess, uh, that I felt that it was useful to have. Right. Again, it's no guarantee of competence, but it is evidence of being serious because you voluntarily are sitting for this exam. And even you know, board certification by be an ABMS board, dermatology, whatever, is still not a guarantee of competence. It means you've been able to take a very difficult test and pass it. Uh, but it's, it's the more of these boxes you can tick off by your surgeon, the more likely you're going to end up in some of the good hands. Well, there's one other thing that we haven't, one other thing that we haven't um, commented on yet, and it's the advice I give to young doctors who come to talk to me about potentially entering the field. And I say to them that, that hair transplant surgery and the management of hair loss is complicated. It's lifelong, it's complex, um, and it needs to be taken seriously. There's a lot to learn. It's not, it's not an easy task. But, and you have to commit to it. And what I mean by that is I say to them, you know, unless you're prepared to have at least a third of your practice devoted to hair, then do not do this. I agree. And I agree. And this is this is something that I say to the patient, right? You know, and, and this is part of their selection process. If you are coming to a doctor who advertises that he has sixteen procedures of which hair transplants is one of them, and then you ask, you should ask, well, how many do you do a week or how many do you do a month? If he does one a month, it's like, do you want the guy that does one appendix a month? Uh, or one appendix every six months, taking out your appendix, or do you want the guy that's doing it all the time? So I think that that's another critical question that the patient can investigate. You know, if, if you go to a doctor who is offering the encyclopedia of surgeries and he occasionally dips his toe into hair transplants, then that should be something we should be quite concerned about. And that would be one of the reasons that they did not join the society, for instance. If they're just dabbling, they do it once in a while, it's not a big part of their life, it's not a big part of their practice, they're not gonna join another society and pay more dues. But if it's a big part of your professional career, then you're gonna join your professional society because that's where, where you're gonna get your education. It's a, it's a you know, warning sign. Yes. I think recognition by peers is important, scholarly activities, uh, it's important. When, when I see a person say they've won best hair transplant surgeon in the world five years in a row. Again, that guarantees they're not because they've paid somebody to say that. When your colleagues give you an, an award like you have received, uh, that means much more. Yes. Now, uh, we get approached all the time, Bob, you know this, um, by uh, organizations that have you know, books that they publish or online um, uh, online list that they publish of you know, most respected surgeons in the world and you just pay for the privilege of being on that list. <laughs> it's, it's really not a credible uh, way to deal with it as well and it's, it's not peer reviewed, this is just people you know, doing marketing by another, uh, by another mechanism. So again, um, if you don't feel as a patient that you are communicating well with the surgeon then that's not the surgeon for you. And because you know you need to feel that you have established a good communication, you need to understand that they understand you and what your goals are, and have given you a realistic assessment of how achievable those goals are. Because 
sometimes patients have really very unrealistic expectations and they need to be gently told that that's the case. So an example that I see um, occasionally is the patient comes in and says, I don't want to take uh, medications because you have to do that for the rest of your life and you stop. Yeah, your hair loss begins again. I just want a permanent solution once. I just want to have a transplant and be done with it for the rest of my life. And there's a 25-year-old sitting in front of you who thinks um, that that's possible. And, you know, the, per- the, the, the clinic that says, no problem, you know, or well, we've got, a, we've got a, an appointment available for you next week. And that's doing a great disservice uh, and um, perpetuating uh, a myth that this is, this is a solution to the problem. It's like saying you're, you're never going to brush your teeth again, you'll just fill your cavities. It doesn't make sense. The prevention of ongoing hair loss is part of what we do. And of course, some offices want people to lose more hair because they're going to make more money when they lose hair. And that's not an that's, ethical well, that's approach. Unfortunately, I had a 32-year-old patient come to see me a couple of weeks ago who had an operation five years ago. And um, he had not been told uh, about medication. And he's balded away from all his frontal glass, which included coming around the corner into the temporal points. And he's now in a lot of quandary because at 32 years of age, he's got this weird looking isolated transplant on the front of his head. He's really quite bald with a limited amount of donor, which they've harvested a significant amount of already. And now it's like, do I go forward? Do I go backward? Do I take them out? Do I laser them out? You know, it's now, it's a complicated problem. And, and we've talked through the various scenarios with him, but there's no easy solution to his problem. And that's just because exactly what you said, the clinic felt that their job was just to operate, give him what he wanted, set him out the door and, uh, and don't do it again. And this is part of the problem with um, cosmetic surgery tourism where people go to parts of the world in cheaper jurisdictions uh, because it sounds extremely attractive to go there and get a very, very cheap transplant. Um, and the problem with that is that uh, these people don't expect to see you ever again. Uh, so they see them, so their job is to give you the operation, you know, 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 graphs, send you on your way, and then someone else has to deal with the problems because the patient has not been educated as to what the future holds. So this problem is rife at the moment with the cosmetic tourism, um, surgery tourism industry. And uh, we're going to have to deal with a lot of uh, unhappy patients over this. Yeah, certainly with, the, uh, with the, uh, the black market, the cosmetic tourism, there's zero opportunity to, to speak with your surgeon in advance of the procedure. Because of course, in many cases, there is no surgeon that will be operating. Uh, and it's so much easier to perform a good procedure at the beginning than try to correct someone's mistake. So it's really, really important for the patient to, to take their time. So the, 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 two, the two aspects, the other thing that the patient should really be aware of, there's two aspects to the operation. There's the technical aspects, right? So if you go into a, a, a dingy, dark, small clinic that doesn't look very well equipped, then you can be a little bit nervous about the technical aspects of it because this is a complicated procedure. I regard uh, the type of hair transplantations we do these days a bit like a military operation. You've got a team of people. It's going to be very well coordinated uh, uh, to make sure that it runs smoothly, that the tissues are treated with respect as they leave the blood supply and then come back to a blood supply. There's a lot of technical issues to it, and that's just part of it. So there's the technical success, which means the ability to get the hair to grow. But the, as absolutely critical is also the artistic success. So it's one thing to have the hair grow, it's another thing to have the hair grow and for it to look wrong. Yeah. So that comes down to hairline design, it comes down to angling and direction of the, the grafts. It comes down to even deciding where to put the grafts uh, on the scalp to make sure that the fallback position is that the patient still looks natural. So those are the two aspects you want to hear your surgeon talking about. You know, you want them to understand that, you know, that, that, that you've got it, you know, that you do it a lot, you've got a good team, experienced team, and that you guarantee your work, right? I think it's very important that they guarantee their work because if it's done properly, the graphs are going to grow. So if you're not prepared to guarantee your work, it's not really admission that you know what you're doing. 
if you guarantee your work, then you want to see examples of what they've done. So you need to ask for that at the time of the consultation. You want to see examples of what they've done. You also want the surgeon to work with you if you're doing, for example, um, talking about hairlines, to do during the consultation. You want to have some discussion with it. And you also want the patient to have input into the discussion. So you, if you are going to a clinic uh, and you speak to the surgeon and he just draws a line, he said, that's what it's going to be, then that's really something that you should be worried about because, you know, if that's just a template that they do on everybody, that means um, that's not really taking into consideration uh, the artistic nature of what, A, there's different shapes of forehead, there's different um, types of people that are prepared to wear more recession, less recession. Um, there's um, angling and direction issues for different people with cowlicks. So you really want to have that artistic discussion uh, with the, the surgeon. And if they spend the time to discuss that part of it as well, that's quite encouraging because that's the equally other part to the technical skill is the artistic um, skill of the surgeon. That's one of the things that attracted me to the field in, in the first place, Bob, was the left brain, right brain interaction between making it happen and making it look good. They're two separate things. Yeah, the, the, the combination of the technical aspect and the artistry, that's, that's the fun part. And again, it emphasizes the importance of talking to your surgeon well in advance of surgery. And if they're a fellow member of the ISHRS and certified to be the ABHRS, it's more likely they understand all the stuff that you just talked about. I think the opportunity to talk with uh, the surgeon's patients is also very nice. I think they'd be very, very helpful because now you're talking to someone who's been there a year, a year before and they can talk about their experience. Luckily, you know, if you treat your patients well, there are a small cohort of them that are willing to undertake that task. I try not to overwhelm them by having you know a group of them, um, uh, so that they're not answering the phone every week to, to to somebody in this regard. But again, if you treat your patients well, and I mean the thing that that really is most gratifying about what we do is that almost invariably the patients come back and tell you how life changing it was, and what they didn't understand is how much of an improvement we'd make to their self confidence, and they are absolutely grateful and delighted about that and they are very very thankful and as i said there are there's a small cohort of them that are more than happy uh, to act as uh, references for you uh, for prospective patients who just want that little bit of reassurance by talking to somebody who's been through the journey super important russell anything else you want to add no i think that that uh Perhaps, you know, like in, at this particular point now, there's what I call, there has been what I call the democratization of the process. And that means that today with the advent of people using the felicity of excision technique exclusively, and that's a different topic that uh, I'm not getting into with you today about whether you should do one technique exclusively. But, there are an enormous number of people entering the field because it's being spun to them that this is an easy process to do. So once upon a time, uh, up until maybe five years ago, I basically knew everybody in Australia that was doing hair transplants seriously. Uh, and I'd met them and I'd talked to them, I knew who they were. Now I'd be lucky to know 20% of the people in Australia five years later that are doing hair transplants. And most of them I have no idea who they are have no idea of their degree of experience or their training. Uh, most of them are not members of ISHRS, uh, although if I meet them, I'm going to encourage them to do so. So the problem is there's been an explosion in the number of surgeons uh, in the last five years into the field. And so it becomes much more difficult for the patient now, in my opinion, uh, to wade their way through competing claims about uh, the clinics, because many of the people that enter the field come into a corporate um, environment rather than start up by themselves and that corporate environment is very slick marketing. Um, so yeah, I think it's become more difficult for the patients now because there is so many different people making competing claims. So it's even more important that they physically meet the surgeon, talk to the surgeon, get a feel uh, for where that surgeon is coming from to make sure that they're making a good decision. Yeah, we've, it'd be nice if the black market 
only occurred in some shady parts of the world. But the black market is certainly alive and well here in the United States, here in Ohio. It's much more difficult for patients to wade through them. There are dozens of places now, just in Ohio, where the surgeons delegate inappropriately to unlicensed individuals, a whole different topic, um, mm. and a real problem. It's very difficult now. Yeah, but even if it's not a black market, even if, even if the surgeon's doing the operation, no idea with these people whether they've been in the field three or six months because the clinic's going to say, you know, we've been here for five years, we've done thousands of operations. Yeah, well, that's true, but the, the surgeon that's operating on you that you might meet at the theatre might have been there five minutes. Yeah. If a patient chooses his or her surgeon wisely, everything else falls into place. And if not, there's a, there's a lot of trouble. Well, most of the problems that develop, um, you know, uh, fall into two categories. You either have the, the surgeon, uh, the surgery being performed poorly with a poor outcome, um, which is obviously an issue. But the other one that is equally important to the patient is failure to meet expectations. So if you haven't communicated well with the patient about realistic expectations and realistic outcomes, um, they can be just as unhappy as a bad operation if you performed a good operation and have an unhappy patient because of failure to meet realistic expectations. Um, so that's, that's, you know, a, that's a cosmetic failure, <laughs> but a technical success. And to the patient, that's just as grievous. Yeah, huge. Well, thank you, Russell, for sharing your wisdom on this important topic. Please watch The Hair Law Show to hear more from Dr. Nutz and Russell, how can our viewers get in contact with you and the Nutson Clinic to explore treatment options? So basically you can uh, type in nudson.com.au in Australia or otherwise go to the Hair Loss Show on YouTube and you'll see that we've got over 100 videos up there with just educational uh, short videos that explain basic biology of hair, basic pathology of hair loss and the different treatment options and their value. Uh, and I think that that's been very, very successful. It's been going for three years. We've got an enormous number of um, people who've watched it, which is very gratifying because it clearly shows that there was a need in the marketplace for some solid information to help patients make good decisions. No question, it's a great show. And that information will appear on the screen as well. I'm sure our viewers found this episode informative and hopefully will assist in making good choices. Again, don't forget to subscribe See you next time on the Hair Transplant Roadshow.